Okay, you need to define the following terms. Can you do this? You know what these mean? Okay. So the terms are antecedent, target behavior, and consequence. Operational, if you're looking at the outcomes of an FBA, when you walk away from an FBA, you need to have an operational description of the problem behavior. Operational description means if I write it down, I can give it to somebody else, I can give it to Margaret, and Margaret can walk into that setting and go, I know exactly what I'm looking for. If I say I'm looking for defiant behavior, is that a good operational definition? Why? Defiant to each of us might look different. For one person, passive non-compliance can be defiance. And for somebody else, it's in your face, cussing, swearing, telling you where to go and how to get there. We need to have a definition that is behaviorally anchored. Where I can say, I can give it to you, Helene. You can see it. It will look exactly to you what it looks like to me. I always say, beware of high inference explanations for student behavior. Look at how many times in your, when you're doing a records review, we talk about students and we say, well, they don't do their work well because they have a learning disability. We get into a circular logic. They fidget and they're out of their chair because they have ADHD. That information isn't very useful. I want to know what does the behavior look like, not that it's ADHD behavior. Very descriptive. What the behavior looks like, sounds like, how it impacts the environment, something we can observe and document. We want to identify the antecedent events that reliably precede or predict the behavior. What does that mean? If you have multiple people in multiple settings and you start discussing when does the behavior occur, what you will usually find is that there is a set of circumstances that always occur. So Mrs. Smith may go, well, it was math class, and it was individual work, and it was on a Thursday. And you go into another teacher and she says, well, it was reading class, it was individual work, and it was on a Friday. And you keep coming around to it and you, all, you go, well, what is consistent there? And eventually you can narrow it down to, it's always happening in independent work. It doesn't matter what the subject is, when I cut the student loose to do independent work, problem behavior escalates. Identification of the behavioral functions based on consequences that appear to maintain the behavior. What does that mean? Help me out, some of the veterans. Consequences are what? Things that follow after, and the function is what they get from it. And what are the two basic classes of functions of behavior? Avoid something or obtain, get something. Okay, good. So we can talk about those in, as objects, activities, people, sensations. Oftentimes we get into things I think that, that can be a little more difficult. I've heard people say, well, they're doing it to get power. You're starting to get into an area that becomes a little more iffy. I think this is in your packet. This is Rob Horner, George Sue Guys. It breaks it out into object, activity, and sensation, physiological, etc. Once we have the behavior clearly defined, we know what happens before and what happens afterwards consistently, we can develop a best guess, a summary, or hypothesis statement. This is why we think that the behavior is occurring, what is, when it's occurring, and what's maintaining it. What we want to do with this is to develop a behavior support plan that is effective and efficient in changing behavior, the smallest change that leads to the largest behavior, behavior change. You asked for a bare bones, skeletal FBA, here it is. The first thing you need to do is identify the problem. What's the teacher complaining about, or what the, what's the person complaining about? Number two is, you collect some information in order to be able to come back and do the next few things. One of those is to define the problem. The next piece is to develop your hypothesis or hypotheses. You want to confirm or disconfirm those, design the intervention, and then check to see if it's working. Okay, so that's the bare basic if you want to just break it down into to the steps. We're going to unpack that a little bit, yeah. Confirm or just confirm the hypothesis. What wouldn't that be using the inter, like making an inter, like once you know that, once you do an intervention, see if it works or not? There's two ways that we do that. One is in the very basic way that we confirm or disconfirm is if an individual has their own hypothesis about it, and we sit down as a team. The most basic way is does the team agree, and how comfortable are they saying this is what we think that the the function of that behavior is. If you as a team aren't sure or in disagreement, 
you may want to go out and do some observations to see if what you're seeing supports the report piece or the, the best guess from that. Does that make sense? So the level of confirmation is going to depend on your level of comfort and confidence in your hypothesis. If everybody around that table says they are doing this to escape math, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going out and doing observation to confirm that. I'm going to develop an intervention. And the intervention, you're right, will then let us know whether or not what we're doing is, was on the right track. Jill? What happens if a student does uh, same particular behavior, but maybe for different functions? Okay. Which so, do you know which one, how do you know which one to work on first, or, or rule the other one out, or mm -hmm. whatever? There's a couple of possibilities, aren't there? There is one possibility, which is that a single behavior in different settings will be used for different purposes. Mm -hmm. And there is the possibility that different behaviors will be used for the same, to serve the same function. Okay. When you break it down into routines, and we're going to talk about this more in just a minute, when you break it down into routines and you say, in math class, they do this behavior, How, what do we think that's about? We think it's escape. We go over into reading. What do we think that's about? Well, I don't think it's about escape there. They can actually do the work very, very well. But what we think we're getting there is a lot of inter, uh, attention from their peers. Now what you're going to need to do is decide which of those you want to focus on. Which of those are you more concerned about? Develop a plan. Intervene there. Move to the next one. I know that there are people who talk about parallel interventions. I'm a little cautious about that. They'd say, well, in reading we're going to do this intervention. In math we're going to do this intervention. If you are juggling too many interventions at once, the team often loses track of what they're trying to accomplish. Focus on one thing, get it squared away, move to the next. What do you guys think about that? Because that's something that, that's a discussion that's come up many times. And there's, I have colleagues that disagree on that. They believe you run multiple interventions at different times and places. What do you think? to have to make a judgment call at that moment to say, okay, I think it's because a lot of our kids are, don't have different classrooms, they have the same classroom, mm -hmm. and so she has strategies for avoidance and strategies for attention. She's never sure at which moment she's using what strategy for what, and it becomes confusing and she just doesn't do any of it. And that actually goes back a lot to what do you have when you have kids with multiple, multiple kids with multiple plans in a single room with a single adult it becomes even more confusing now. And to have one kid with multiple plans, that's my thinking. Yes? I think oftentimes it's, it's really a response to what the adults in the environment need, which is we see all of these problems and we have to take care of all of them right now. And I think the more important thing when you're trying to shift behavior is to let the child feel some early success. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to do too many things at once, that's not going to happen. Right. It's also about helping the adults experience success, isn't it? Because a lot of times people go, you can't change this kid's behavior. We've tried this for years. What are you going to do that we haven't tried? Getting a success creates behavioral momentum. Yes. 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 Um, Carrie. I have two situations. One is we have a student that is suspended for a broad weapon school with a one-time offense. How do you do an FDA on something that wasn't, like you said, low frequency? I mean, it would be. I wouldn't. Now, I'll, I don't, do you know what the policy, what the, is there state policies that apply in Illinois? I have never heard this for a specific single event behavior. It's a, so you can back up to aggression, you can back up to other kinds of behavior, but if you're doing an FBA on a, a one-time incident. It's, it's not necessary. It's not, an issue, it's not an issue of it not being necessary. It's an issue that it, FBA is not appropriate because you're looking for patterns of behavior. In fact, it has some of the same struggles that a threat assessment has, which is if it's only existed once, then how do you know under what conditions the student poses a threat? Not makes a threat, but poses a threat. If it's happened one time, you're going to have to do a lot of work on that. There may be legal requirements, and in some cases, you know, if you're being told to do that, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. What I'm going to say is an FBA will not be uh, ideal or best practice in a situation on a one-time event. Now, is there lower order problem behavior that has preceded that? None. None. Are you sure or is it covert? In both instances, no. OK. 
Okay? I mean, my concern is, is do you have a sense of why the kid, ask the kid, why did you bring a gun to school? Did, he, I mean, did, you, did anybody ask him or her? We, would, we were not given the opportunity to. I think your chances of doing a, anything worthwhile in an FBA is about that. Because if you can't talk to the kiddo to, to help ascertain, or, or their friends, their friends might have a sense of it. We were excluded from the whole class. All I can tell you is that's not best practice from my perspective. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not telling you that it's the right or wrong thing. There's, again, this is about competing interests, right? Was the student removed, sent somewhere else? I mean, again, that goes back to that competing interest of after the school shootings, people wanted these kids, take them away, do something with them, lock them up. And Oregon, after, after uh, Thurston's shooting, had the Kip, Kip Kinkle law that you could remove a student for a year. And they went on and on. And they thought they were going to override federal law. And right? People get afraid. And fear does some pretty strange things to people. But here's, here's what you can do is you can say, let's talk to some of the friends and see if we can figure out patterns of why it might be. It's a little different than an FBA. It's really more about a threat assessment in many ways. But if I knew that that student wanted to show his friend's dad's gun, I mean, yeah, could we say that's attention-seeking behavior? Of course we could. Can we develop a plan? My second um, incident is I have a kid coming back from an uh, alternative school. Mm -hmm. Um, do I need to do an FBA at that time when he comes back from a semester? What was the behavior of concern? Um, a lot of weapons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it was the one time, and this is a low functioning kid. Mm -hmm. It was the one time event, um, and, the, and he didn't really like the consequences of his actions. So that's why the district is allowing him to come back after one semester of alternative school. Okay. So then a behavior an FBA will then need to be conducted at that you're going to have to develop a safety plan and a support plan, and it's going to look different depending on what it is. If this student got conned into bringing a gun to school, it's not about the student. The support plan is about the adults creating situations in which, you know, we talk, deal with other kids. You're really talking more about a safety plan in my experience. But you're also, you can think about it from a functional assessment perspective and say, if this kid is bringing it to show off to other kids, can we make sure that they get an opportunity to show off in other more appropriate ways? Could we develop a support plan that way? Absolutely. If this is an issue of the kid being bullied and harassed, can we back up and change setting events and, and antecedents where we're looking at why is this kid experiencing bullying and harassment? Yeah, we can do that. It's just that from the true functional assessment or functional behavioral assessment, can you see a pattern in one behavior? No, we might need to broaden what we're looking at though. Because my experience is kids who are attention seeking seek attention in more ways than just bringing a gun to school. They've probably been attention seeking in other inappropriate ways. If they've been responding to bullying and harassment in inappropriate ways, they will respond in many inappropriate ways before simply bringing a weapon. There's, there's a long history of that if you look at the Secret Service reports and the, uh, the work that they've done. Is there's usually a pattern of behavior. It's not usually like pop, it's just a, a gun and a one shot thing. There's usually something else. You can do a functional assessment, but not end up having to do a bit. I would never do a functional assessment without a behavior support plan. I, I'm not sure I understand why you would... If you do an assessment and you find that a bit is not needed. So give me an example of where... No, no, that's okay. No, that's, let's keep working through this because this is an important question. If for a one-time event, we okay. come up with this, you know, let's think. just needs a... Verbal support, or you know, rather than a plan. What is verbal support? It's an intervention. If your behavior intervention plan is to provide additional support, whether that's giving lots of recognition and reinforcement for appropriate behavior, you've just developed a behavior intervention plan. Because what you've assumed in in our discussion, and what you would come to the conclusion, I'm assuming in your FBA is that the behavior of bringing the gun was to get attention and if attention, this kind of goes back to what Sherry was saying earlier, make sure you connect the function to the, to the support or intervention. So if you believe that the reason for the inappropriate behavior was, was attention seeking, I mean you've only got one point on the reference to, to look at if you're looking at just the gun issue, then what you're going to do though is to say what do I think the function is if it's needing support in the terms of attention, positives, recognition, reinforcement, you've just developed a behavior support plan. 
and you can teach behavior and we can go into some of those other pieces. There was, there was a... Uh, the author, Gavin DeBecker, mm -hmm. gift of fear. He's, a, he's an advisor to the Secret Service on this very, very issue. Gavin DeBecker, the gift of fear. The gift of fear was the was the kind of it was a it was involved in the process uh, the Secret Service looking at the school shooting incidents. You can also look at work of William Pollock, who wrote Real Boys and what the experience is and how do we support kids, uh, etc. Yes. You talked about a threat assessment. What do you think? Like, like Let me say this in just one really easy because I don't want to take too much time on this because that's like three days of training all by itself. It's does a student pose a threat to the safety and well-being of themselves or others at a school? I think a lot of times, if, if there's an incident, then we'll be able to do an FBA mm -hmm. on the student, like right away, like mm -hmm. kind of like you were saying. Yeah, there's actually a booklet that goes through this very, very nicely. It's by the U.S. Secret Service and the U.S. Department of Education, published in 2002. You can go online and get it. They're free. It's a, it's a small booklet, and it walks you through the steps, walks you through when you do it, when you don't do it, what we know from previous school shootings. It's, it's a, an excellent, excellent resource. It's very easy to read. You can sit down and read it in one setting, but you're going to need to go back and work through it. Threat assessment is a huge, huge topic. And I don't really want to go too much into that right now. OK, I'm going to, yes. Oh, sorry. That's right. When you talk about covert behaviors, I know what I'm thinking of as covert behaviors. I'm not sure we're on the same page. And in that case, what would you recommend? In covert behaviors, it does become a lot more difficult. Um, you're going to look to see if you can find an overt out, but covert behavior is, is one of those things that that's, that's not an easy one. What do you think of when you define covert behaviors, by the way? How do you? I, I may be in a different page. Um, I've had in the past a student who was pretty well recognized by his peers to be a bully mm -hmm. and could never be caught doing anything. Mm -hmm. It was always after the fact. Yeah. You can talk about it this from a couple of different ways. You can talk about internalizing behaviors, and I've heard people talk about that. I'm not sure really that that's where we want to go, but the covert behavior of the kids who are truly at the top of the pyramid, the most uh, antisocial kids, are often very difficult to identify because they do it with a look. I just had an elementary school that had a fifth grader that was doing this. They had four or five kids that were going out and trashing other kids, and you could never figure out what it was because there was one kid behind it all and they were all so scared of this kid that they would do anything he said. That, that level of covert behavior is very hard to connect back to doing an assessment on. Is there any recommended course of action? If, I mean, part of it is it has to be overt at some level or made overt at some level so we even know it's existing. Mm -hmm. At the point where a student you know, made the report that this student was doing that, then there were issues of setting up safety plans. And part of that was just physically, in this case, they restricted his movement. They made sure that when he moved, he had somebody with him. There was, it was more of a safety plan in many ways than a behavior support plan. It was, it was pretty ugly. This was a kid who was very disturbed and very socially skilled. Yeah. OK. For those of you who haven't seen this model yet, setting event, antecedent, problem behavior, and consequence. Step one is the definition of the problem. Back up and tell me what happens right before that problem. What happens right after the problem. And then back to the setting event. Are there things that increase the chance that the behavior will occur, occur again? I want to go to a couple of things well, let me not have this. When we talk about distal or proximal, we want to know what happens right before the behavior. That's most likely to be the trigger or antecedent. One of the ways that we think of this is this sets up, this sets off. Does that make sense? So for example, we can say when a student comes to school and they haven't had a good bus ride, where kids have been teasing and taunting on the bus, they get off the bus, they're agitated and upset. It didn't trigger the behavior, but when they go into math class and the teacher says, I'd like you to work on long division, and the kid comes unglued, the immediate antecedent was what? 
a task directive, being asked to do some kind of work, but what set it up, what increased the chances that that trigger was going to set off the behavior was the setting event. It was something that happened sometimes long ago. It could even be a learning history. Remember the kid that wadded up the piece of paper, threw it on the ground, said, I can't do this, I'm stupid? The learning history becomes a setting event. Things that are all the way back here can sometimes be very effective ways to intervene. Okay. Lots of different sources of information. And I am really pushing it, huh? There's another question that you need to ask. When you're looking at the behavior, the question is, does the student have the skill set to do it? Is it a can-do or will-do problem? Is it a skill deficit or a performance problem? If you don't know if the student can do it, find out. And the way to do that is to increase the reinforcement until you get the student to do it under some kind of condition to find out if they can do it, if they're skilled at it. Then it's a performance issue. If we know the student can do it, then the issue can go to that motivation and the supports look like motivation issues. If the trigger is a math pro set of math problems or a situation in the math class and they can't do the math, we need to change that issue of the performance, making sure that we're matching the curriculum to the student's level of performance. The level of needed support is there, etc. Balanced assessment, we need to know what the student's strengths are as well as weaknesses and we need to make sure that we do a functional assessment of appropriate behavior. Have you, is this something that you've heard before? The functional assessment of appropriate behavior, oftentimes we focus on when kids are inappropriate. I want you to also look at when they are appropriate. So let's say that they go to Azel's class and the kid's just wild and crazy, right? And they come over to another class and they're not. And I say, well, what's that about? What is it that Helene does differently than Azel? If we look at the differences, if we look to see what stimulates what is, the student is responding to that uh, creates appropriate behavior, it helps us set up our behavior support plan. Find out under what conditions the student is appropriate as well as inappropriate. I want to focus on a tool here. I'm guessing that Terry Scott, when he met with you, gave you the facts. Is that correct? The facts, part A and B? Does this look in your packet? Go ahead and take a look at your packet. It is a data collection tool. Starts with the behavior support plan, the competing pathways. Underneath it has the four columns. Does that look familiar? Good. You've seen that before? You've got that. Excellent. One of the things that I would encourage you to take a look at as well is in the master packet. It's not in your work packet, but in the master packet, there's actually some additional things that you might want. And did I manage to miss it? <coughs> Hope not. Oh, here it is. It is five pages from the back and six pages. It looks like this. There are two that look almost exactly alike. It says behavioral event or behavioral intervention worksheet. This is just a data collection tool that some people like to use. And it gives you the four columns, one for setting events, one for antecedents, one for the target behavior, and one for the consequences. In the target behavior column, you describe what the problem or target behavior looks like. And then you look at antecedents. Down in the box below are some examples of what some antecedents might look like. You can back up to what some setting events might look like. And you can look over at what maintaining consequences might look like. If you've looked at the events Behavioral Events workshop Worksheet, this is in the master packet, not the, it's in this packet, right there, yep, perfect, okay. If you've done this, then all you need to do is flip over to the next page, which is the Behavioral Intervention Worksheet, and look and see if you can match up the function at each level, uh, the function that you've identified with the intervention at the end. You, for example, start with setting event interventions. Let's just start there and work our way through this. 
Setting events. If you know that the student is arriving sleepy and that's when they melt down, can you reinforce and reward appropriate sleep habits? Teach appropriate sleep habits. Pay attention to that. One of the great setting event interventions in education is the free and reduced lunch. A lot of kids were coming to school hungry, they were getting irritable, fidgety, etc. That is a setting events intervention. Once you've identified what your setting event is, if you can, if you can't, that's fine, you write that into your setting event intervention. Antecedent, do the same thing. Now, I want to be really clear here because I think what we've historically done is we've focused almost entirely on consequences. We've focused almost entirely on the C part of the, of the equation. A preventive model backs up and says if you can eliminate this at the antecedent or setting event stage, do it. But don't stop your plan there. Make sure your plan includes setting events if you can identify them, antecedents, the antecedent is how can we change the environment so it doesn't elicit that behavior. If we know that the student is responding to being bullied and that's why he's acting out and, and being tough, then maybe the issue is we need to set up a better supervision schedule so that bullying and harassment is not allowed. Maybe we need to set up a policy and procedure teaching around anti-bullying uh, harassment, make sending clear messages to students that it's not okay. The other thing we need to do is to teach the behavior you want and that's in the behavior intervention strategies. If we, don't, if we have students that can't problem solve through it, we need to teach them how to problem solve through it. And at the end, the consequence piece, if a student is escaping math class, let's make the, the connection to what would be a good intervention. If we think that the student is using inappropriate behavior to escape math, talk to me about interventions. You can do this. Put them some free time or whatever if they make the choice to escape an activity shortly. So we might say we want to give them the ability to escape briefly. So we might say, you know, can I, am I correct? Break? You know, actually, in fact, a lot of folks who are not hearing impaired use signs because what we know is behavior disordered kids in escalation, the, the uh, verbal abilities drop pretty quickly. And so we teach kids who are very verbal and very capable under normal conditions to say, I need a break. Or it can be, an, it can be anything. It can be unique to that student. But the ability to stop the torture, right? If, if the math class is the torture, can they say enough is enough? That's what we do with adults, right? We say, I need to get out of here for just a minute. Give me a minute to calm down. <coughs> now we need to set up a system to encourage them to come back. And we need to back up and say, if the antecedent condition is this work is too hard, that's on us, not the kids. We need to back up and say, is this the appropriate curriculum and instruction? Is the student well placed? Do they have the skills to do the task that, at hand? And do they have an appropriate behavior in order to escape the task when they need to, and the structure and support to return to the task as quickly as possible. What if we think they're getting it for, if they think they're acting out because they're getting attention from peers? What would be an appropriate process? I want you to walk through now. Let's walk through real quickly. Student is in math class, but now we say, I don't think that the student has a problem with the skills. I think they're doing it to get attention. Back up. What would we start with? Let's back all the way up to setting events. Does it occur on certain days or at certain times of day? For some of our students, it's the long day. I was just in a school that had, I think it was four and a half hours before there was any breaks. I mean, it was like three minute breaks. What we found was is that you could actually track very nicely escalating behavior across the school population, not just this student. As it got closer and closer to lunch, behavior started escalating. Okay. Let's look at some of the structure of the programs. But let's say it's escape, it, it's uh, attention motivated behavior around math class. What would be some interventions that would need, that would respond to the need for attention? Yes. How about uh, try to uh, involve him in a way that he can teach appropriately, such as helping teach a, a problem, or whatever, use a way in which he can get the same, get some attention from peers, but doing it in a way that is. Mm -hmm. Math and mm -hmm. be creative and figure out how you can do that. Yeah, and I would say that there's two things you want to think about is non-contingent attention. It doesn't matter 
what they're doing that day? How can we make sure that that student is getting attention just by being there? And number two, how can we make sure that they get contingent attention, which is when they do the behavior we want, they're getting lots of positives for it. Making sure that the connection to the identified function in the behavior support plan is a critical part of behavior support planning. And I would actually encourage you to even think about using a different word. You can talk about function, but with somebody that doesn't understand it, talk about need. What does the student's need? Because you're meeting a need for the student. If your behavior support plan does not meet the need, you might as well not develop it. Go back and take a look at the need that needs to be met. So if you think about this, if kids are starved for attention, find a way to give it to them. If they're starved, find a way to feed them. Match the need with your support. If it doesn't match, you're going to be in trouble. This is an awful lot for one day, isn't it? I've had a couple people say that. Boy, we've cruised through a ton of stuff. We really cruised through this very fast. I want to talk about a couple of implementation issues really quick, quickly. We talked about the team a little bit. There was a couple of other implementation issues that came up at the beginning of the day. Please remind me what they were. Who remembers? Have we, not, have we talked about them? We talked about doing it as a team. <coughs> what were some of the other ones? Well, You're just done, huh? Stick it. a fork in you. <laughs> we talked about doing it in sort of that expert model way, but when you're not the team or the person who's actually doing the implementation, how do you engage and, and sort of get cooperation for the plan you develop? If you look in your, the master packet, should be almost the last thing that's in there. One, two, three, it's the last four pages. Is something called a self-assessment of contextual fit in schools. The self-assessment of contextual fit. If you have developed, if your team does not include the people who implement the behavior support plan, then you need to walk through this. And this is, does it fit with what you believe? If you're asking somebody to reinforce students for appropriate behavior and they believe it's wrong to use tangibles or to use extrinsic rewards, etc., your program's going to go in the trash can or the circular file, the file cabinet or something. It's not going to be used. You want to know, does this fit with the values of the people asked to implement? You want to know if they can do it. Doability is critical. If they tell you they can't, it doesn't matter how elegant it is, it will not work. I actually, I know that we're right at the end, I want to just mention something. There's a lot of forms in there that you can use if you want to. I, you know, there's things in there that are just there for resources for you. I want to go down to the end of this just a minute. And I want to focus on what happens when our behavior support plan isn't achieving the results we want. There's a couple of questions that you need to always ask about your behavior support plan. Number one is, did we implement the plan as we said it was going to be? In other words, did we change the environment and the staff behavior the way we plan to? Behavior support plans are for whom? They're for us. They're not for the student. The outcomes will, will benefit the student, but they're about changing what we do. If you have a behavior support plan that says, Johnny will, you're, you're probably in the wrong ballpark. I want to know what the staff will do, what you will do with the environment, how you set up changes, and what we're going to do to make sure that we elicit the behavior we want. And then, have we achieved the desired outcomes that we want? That piece of have we changed us is that have we taught it? Have we set up an environment? All of those pieces. A couple of cautions. We need to be careful, the BIPs are for us, be careful about blaming the victim in this case, talking about students as, well, the student is resistant to our intervention. We need to make sure back up and say, when we're at this level, our intervention didn't work. Because there isn't a higher level of intervention at some level here. Lowered expectations is a concern. I want to end with this piece of it here. 
I want you to understand that when you're working with kids at the level where an FBA and a behavior support plan are, are important parts of, of their IEP, we're talking about kids who take a great toll on us as individuals. One of the pieces that should be in place is what do you do to support each other? What kind of supports are there for the professionals, for the supporters? What happens when the teacher in that classroom has this kid and the kid has pushed her button for the 353rd time this period and she's ready to punch his lights out? I don't know if you've experienced that, but most people I know and I've experienced that. That question of what do you do when you get to the end of your rope with a kid who is really tough, when you're really tired? We need to have a plan in place because burnout is real. I'll tell you one last story. I was working with a kid that wasn't even in my program. We had a building in a U shape. He was in one side of it. My program was in the other, but he came running down the halls, cussing and swearing, and he took a swing at a little kid and took a run at another adult. <laughs> and we were trained to do basket holds with this little guy. Now, I had just been up for two days straight because my girlfriend had been in a serious car accident. I was very sleep deprived. I put him into a basket hold and I was too tired to be there. And as a result, instead of doing what I knew was best practice of turning my head to the side and keeping my head back, I let my head go forward and as soon as that happened, he yep, reared back and busted my nose. That wasn't his fault, that was my fault. Yes, did he make a choice to do a behavior? I, yeah, but the reason that I got injured was my fault. Why? Because I was tired. And there's a time and a place we need to self-evaluate how we're doing, whether or not we're in a position to do the, imp the intervention the way we need to. Don't place yourself at risk. If you need help, set up plans where you can say, if I'm in a crisis, I will call this person or that person. I know a way to notify somebody where I can say, I need to be out of this now. Now I sat behind Tom, blood streaming down the front of me. He didn't have a clue that he had just busted my nose until the clinical director walked in and said, Dale, looks like you could use some help. Yes, thank you. <laughs> now, this burnout piece, we need to make sure we have plans in place and I would encourage every time that you've got a plan that you've developed for, your, for a student where you've got a behavior support plan, make sure that you have identified who that service direct provider can reach out to when they're struggling. Watch for signs of compassion fatigue. When you hear student, uh, staff making comments that become, start becoming increasingly derogatory or negative about the student, back up and say, what are we doing here? Are you okay with taking care of this kiddo? It's really important we take care of ourselves. We have to be able to implement the plan with compassion. In order to do that, you have to be present for yourself and able to do that. I'm just going to mention, I understand that what you do is important. I also understand that you don't often get the kind of rewards and supports that you need. What you do for kids in the green zone is important. They'll value it. It will make a difference in their life. What you do for kids in the yellow zone is a quality of life issue. We know this, this is evidence-based. And it is very clear that what you do for these kids in the red zone is not just a quality of life, but it is actually a life and death issue. These kids in the red zone sometimes have life expectancies, depending on the subgroup, as much as 11 years shorter than your average child's or your average kiddo's lifespan. What you do for these kids really matters. It is hugely important. I wish that I could be your Clarence and show, you know, that I remember It's a Wonderful Life and he could show them the, the payoff for what the work that they had done. I wish you could see that. I wish you could know that on a day-to-day -day basis. But always be thinking in that visionary place. These are often kids that don't come back and their families often don't come back to tell us thank you. But I will tell you on behalf of those kids and on their families, you make a difference in these kids' lives that is huge. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing best practice. Keep growing. Keep developing your skills so that we can work better and better with these students. And in the end, it does make a difference. It does make a, a community a better place to live. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for spending the afternoon. I'll be here.
ask questions. <laughs>